Welcome to today's webinar. This is part two in the Evolving Your Remote First Workforce series. Today's session is about and is titled Adapting to Tech Changes, Free Trials and Promotions to, to Enhance Remote Worker Productivity. My name is Andrew Rigg. I'm a solution architect at Perfect Image. and My focus is around public cloud, specifically Azure and AWS. Perfect Image is a managed service provider located in the northeast of the UK. We're a consultancy-led business with over 90 IT professionals across three business units covering business intelligence, business systems, and IT infrastructure. I'll do my best to answer anything as we go. Otherwise, I'll put these out at the end. During this webinar, what we're going to do to discuss is AWS Workspaces versus Windows Virtual Desktop. So what's the difference between the two products and what trials and promotions are available? Uh, Microsoft Office and Teams promotions. Now, there's extended trials and promotions available with several Office 365 plans. Microsoft's trying to do their, do their bit during these difficult times to enable your users to benefit from Office 365 to increase your remote work capabilities. Planning. And now planning for your planning during the migration is key for its future success and maximizing cost savings. Communication throughout the project is key also. During the planning stages of the 365 project, involve members from all departments. This will ensure you've got the full support and you and you can push through and drive changes, especially if you're attempting a, a rapid migration. Carefully choose what products and services you're going to implement. Yeah, and prioritize those services relevant to your business. Start with the most critical files and services and work backwards to the archive data. Now Teams, Teams is more than a conferencing platform, right? But at the moment, this is by far one of the most useful tools in the 365 stack. Teams is bringing together people uh, and increasing the productivity uh, by allowing users to continue to work and communicate as if they're still in the office. Whether you're using Teams, OneDrive, or SharePoint to create, store, and share your documents, the ability to co-author means you'll no longer end up with multiple versions of the same document, now, where someone will still have to combine several documents to get at the end, right? And was that the right version to start with? So that's what you want to avoid any of those possibilities. SharePoint will retain up to 500 versions of each and every document. And of course, as part of your 365, uh, kind of package, you've got Word, PowerPoint, Excel, Outlook, Publisher, but these aren't the standard versions, right? So what you get in Office 365 is the power of Microsoft Azure. So Office 365 leverages the services like artificial intelligence that enhance your Office experience. You may, you may have noticed the subtitles at the bottom of this screen. Well, this is just one of the features that's only available in 365 and isn't available in the likes of the volume licensing or the off-the-shelf purchases. Now, turn those off just so we get a bit more screen real estate. Why use desktop virtualization? Well, it helps companies to address specific business needs. So more secure access to data and organizational resources helps with compliance for industry regulations, so finance, healthcare, government. It allows for rapid expansion, mergers, acquisitions, it could be for short-term employees or contractor or partner access. It also helps with uh, employee specific needs. So if you've got BYOD policies, uh, mobile staff, call center, branch workers, and in this case, remote workers. It also allows for specialized workloads. So if you have GPU requirements for design and engineering, if you've got legacy applications, uh, software for dev and test, uh, those short-term environments that you need to run up. So moving to a hosted desktop helps keep your data secure. Virtual desktops are deployed in secure virtual networks and the storage is encrypted and controlled by either Microsoft Azure's Key Vault or in AWS, it's their key management services. So you no longer have user data stored on the local user devices. This improves your security and reduces your overall risk. You can't lose a cloud desktop, but you can lose a laptop. And what if it's a personal device? How do you know that it was encrypted? Uh, 
So you can access cloud desktops directly from a wide ranging devices, right? Uh, PC, Mac, iPad, Android tablets, Chromebooks, and web browsers, just like Firefox and Chrome. This gives you the tools to deliver a secure, responsive desktop experience, no matter what device your, your, your users choose to use. And it helps make your BYOD initiative a reality. So onboarding or offloading large numbers of employees very fast, easy and secure access to company applications and data, right? So this is often, so users often have a diverse set of devices and this can be achieved without spending the money on replacing you know, large hardware refreshes or going through lengthy complex integrations. For the specialized workloads, so if your users have a have requirement for increased compute or specialized workloads, rather than purchasing specific hardware that users may only use occasionally, you can now pay for it when you use it. Right? So the example of this, if you have a user that requires a GPU optimized machine and they require 12 cores, 112 gig RAM, so it's a specialty workload, but they only may need this for one day each month. So what you'd expect to pay in the cloud is about 25 pounds for that month, for that day's usage, right? rather than spending thousands on purchasing the hardware. AWS has a good um, remote work offering at the moment for Amazon Workspaces. So this began in April 1st, and it's been extended through till September 30th. It had been until June 1st, um, but luckily it's been extended. But now I would expect this to be extended again you know, as Azure and um, AWS kind of trade off their 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 um, their services, you know, and trying to attract the new business. But there's no guarantee that it will be extended again. So this offer is, is available for up to 50 users. So this is their no charge or their free tier. You know, and it's for their value standard and performance tiers. Importantly, it's only for new um, workspace customers, so not existing workspace customers. You can be an existing AWS customer, that's fine, just around the workspaces. So it's valued for around four and a half thousand pounds per month. Now, so you're able to provide the users with a, with, with a Windows 10 session for effectively free. So it makes total sense for companies with workloads already, already in AWS. But just remember after September, this is what you should budget to pay to continue to use the service. Uh, AWS Workspaces, it's seen as a desktop as a service, not as VDI or virtual desktop infrastructure, as you don't need to manage the hardware patches or the OS version. Uh, Windows Virtual Desktop, um, from, um, so it's promotional funding is constantly changing. Now it's best to check with us to find out what's available for your business. But in general, what's always available is your proof of concept funding. Now this is valued at £3,000 over, over a two month period and it's not restricted to Windows Virtual Desktop. It can be used for pretty much any Azure workload. Um, so this allows for targeted um, um, proof, um, proof, of concept, um, proof, proof of concept projects. <laughs> Sorry, mouthful there. Um, now larger funding is available and we can work with you to apply on your behalf. Now we've helped a number of businesses with grants of £25,000 to be spent over a 12 month period. Um, but most recently we've helped a customer with £100,000 over, over the 12 month period. So this is free credits available to you. It's part of a sponsorship subscription. Um, all the VMs re remain in your Azure tenancy. So ownership and access will never be an issue. Now Windows Virtual Desktop is also referred to as WVD and it's Microsoft's new hosted Windows 10 multi-session multi experience. It's, very, it's a very important and strategic product for Microsoft and any business looking for a remote working solution. With Windows Virtual Desktop, you can now have groups of users sharing session hosts and the profiles attached to the host on login instantly with the use of SFX logic. This means that hosting costs are vastly reduced. So an example is for a 50 user environment, you can expect to pay around 10 pounds per user per month. Now the Windows 10 license costs are covered by your Microsoft 365 license already. 
Now, the price per user per month reduces as you add users. So if you have a 500, 500 user environment, you can expect to pay around five pounds per user per month. So when you look at the traditional um, desktop services or, or RDS, in the past, you'd have to manage and maintain the entire environment. For a truly highly, highly available environment, you would require multiple web and gateway service, um, servers. You'd also require a minimum of two brokers, separate desktop and app services. So you need around that kind of eight to 10 service that you have to manage, patch and maintain and secure. Now, our outbound inbound port 3389 would also have to be opened. So this increases the potential security risks if misconfigured. Whereas with the release of the um, of Windows Virtual Desktop, you now only have to manage your session hosts. Microsoft takes care of the rest. With the latest spring release, users can, uh, can access the full desktop and published applications from the same host pool. So this means that you are now only require two servers for a fully fault tolerant, highly available environment. You no longer have to open port 3389. Connections are initiated by the WVD service. Uh, so users can connect to the desktop um, yeah, so the, to the full desktops or the published applications from their preferred device securely from almost any device from any internet connection. Uh, so Microsoft provides the managed services for the front end resources and also manages the back end compute and storage networking. So all that's left for you to do is to choose what is, what's the right compute, choose your type of storage, so standard hard drive or premium SSD, and configure the network for the session hosts. By storing the profiles in, in Azure files, uh, FSX logic um, profiles for the users can be attached at the point of login to any of the session hosts that the user has access to. So the acquisition of SSX logic has really been the enabler for Windows Virtual Desktop. So this provides the profile container service. So it replaces roaming profiles and folder redirections. So it dramatically speeds up the, the login and application launch times. With this, you can also configure app masking. So this helps to minimize the number of gold images by creating a single image with all the applications installed and you effectively hide or mask the application from the users who don't require it or shouldn't see it in the first place. So you can take advantage of um, the reserved instances that Azure operate as well. So you've got one year and three year options. So you can save up to 70% versus the pay as you go pricing. Now, the licenses that you have on screen here are basically the licenses, that, so the Microsoft 365 licenses that have the rights to access the, the Windows Virtual Desktop and also have access to the FSX profile. Uh, so the FXS Logix application that, that does the profile management. Last slide on Windows Virtual Desktop. Um, this wasn't meant to be a deep session on this, but I just wanted to, um, to, to, to run through it just, just so you're aware of what it is. You can have a think about it and think, is it right for you? So if you want to run through the self-assessment, I'll just check to see if there's any questions. Okay, so I've got one here. So when would I use the Windows Virtual Desktop um, yeah, over AWS workspaces? So if you're new to public cloud and you don't have any workloads in either AWS or Azure, that's kind of one thing there where you may head towards a, um, uh, Azure. And then it depends upon what 365 licenses you have as well. Because if you've already paying for your 365 license, then you don't need to pay for something again with, um, within the AWS environment. But, and also depends upon the size of your environment, right? Because if you're if requirement for auto scaling, so where ho extra hosts are automatically added as your users start to consume these ones, that's when uh, another reason to go to Windows Virtual Desktop. Um, yeah, yes, and as I said, it depends upon the number of users. Yeah, because if you have a single user, then AWS may be the cheaper option. But we also need to consider the functionality and your workload requirements. 
another question here too. So I have approximately 70 users who need business hours access, but four users that require 24 seven. So how can I save money? So this kind of goes with, a, with the above question actually, because you've got different scaling options. So you can do a depth first scaling, which is when you, so you specify the maximum numbers of users per VM. So you've, so you've done the work to kind of right size your VMs and kind of get the workloads right. So then as the users log in and you reach the threshold, then, then, then another VM is automatically added to the pool. So as the, as the users increase, the numbers of hosts increase. As the users log off or have inactive sessions, then the hosts also power down. So with this, you can specify the minimum number of hosts available to you. So you've always got at least one host available to, to your 24 seven. Okay, I'll move on. So um, apologies for the small text. Um, if, you, if you want us to send you this, we can. Uh, COVID-19 is, is continuing to impact everyone. And just want to take a few minutes to talk through what what offers you know, we are doing, but also working with Microsoft to, to what they're offering um, to basically allow companies to be to, to have a remote workforce. So on the screen is a, is a few of the current promotional offerings for 365, and there's a number of ways to access these trials. Our preferred method is via the CSP route. So this is where we provide you with the subscription and the licenses, as this is the only way that we can initiate and truly manage on your behalf. Now, the most one of the most popular um, options here is the is the 365 e1 trial because you get six months free and there's no limits on users now there's always t's and c's that go with these but we'll work with you to go through these to determine which trial is the best for you uh, e1 normally costs around six pounds per user per month um, now some of the key products you get with the e1 is the online versions of office so word excel outlook and you get the services such as Outlook, SharePoint, Teams, and OneDrive. What you don't get is the full desktop client. And you don't get the more advanced security and compliance piece that you kind of get with the E3 and going forward. Um, now, generally we see these features being implemented much later in the migration process. So if a full featured desktop and client application isn't a requirement, then E1 plan may suit you and your requirements to kickstart your migration and provide your users with the online tools they require for, for a remote workforce. So Microsoft's committed to make Teams free for all during these times. So right now there's more than 45 million um, workers using Teams and there's over 900 million meetings per day hosted on Teams. So these, this is double of what pre-COVID times are. So working from home, what could go wrong? Teams custom backgrounds and background blur have helped people feel more professional, if not the very least more comfortable in their own home during the meetings. I think most of you will remember these clips, one from a few years back and the other just from a few weeks ago. Background blur is effective even, even in some of the most chaotic of rooms. Teams custom backgrounds also have put a bit of fun back into the office workplace with many teams each trying to outdo each other on their calls. Just like the previous clip, a lot of us have the young ones at home as well and they still want entertaining throughout the day. They often make appearances during the meetings with fuzzy hands or faces in the background or pride to place or after a meeting with the favorite backgrounds. Just like that BBC kind of clip we, we saw there, if you have the black background blur going in the background, it's, it doesn't really distract from anyone who you try to have that meeting with. So here's some tips and considerations when planning your migration. 
So communication. Communication is the number one priority for the project. If, if the communication breaks down, the users will feel the effect and be the first to react. This can then cause delays and extend the migration with added costs and unnecessary extra reviews, more testing, smaller changes. Effectively, the project can be railroaded and the goal or the reason for the migration to 365 can be forgotten. How users access the data is just one of the considerations for the migration. Depend upon the scale of migration, you may just be starting with an email migration, um, or you could be including SharePoint, OneDrive, and Teams. So, but these ones are all about, this, about data and services. But when users have a cloud presence, they also have a cloud identity. Securing the user's cloud identity should be the primary focus, as the identity now provides access to the data and the resources. In the past, you would have considered that your office building was your perimeter you know, and the first line of defense to protect the data and the resources. You know, this is because the building housed your infrastructure, but importantly, your users had to go to the office you know, and you could control that environment. The users typically sat at the same desk, accessed the company resources via a computer that, that, that you provided and controlled. Uh, Multi-factor authentication should be enforced for all users with a cloud identity. If you have a Microsoft 365 plan that includes Azure AD P1, then conditional access policies um, you know, should, um, should be used over the user base because this, this gives you more control. So more, more about this one on a later slide. So who, who will be in your planning teams? Don't leave all the planning up to the IT team. Involve all members from all departments um, so, so, so information can be can be filtered um, both up and down regarding on what's getting moved, when and how to access the data importantly as it's being moved. You get everyone on board. Allowing enough time for the migration will ensure nothing is rushed and allow teams to identify what data is to be moved and what is priority. Start with the most urgent, most recent files and work backwards. And, you know, and then identify that content that can be archived as well. So what's your contingency plan? Not all migrations run without hitch, as much as we try. <laughs> uh, if the scale of the migration has been under here, so one thing is if the scale of the migration has been underestimated, you know, network and internet bandwidth you know, um, yeah, can, can crash, it can suffer outages, things that are beyond your control. This is where communication is critical. Ensure you've communicated with the affected users before the migration is, is scheduled and again later afterwards. Ensure they have enough time to organize their workloads so if access to files they require are unavailable for that extended period. Reviews should, always, should, um, should always be completed after each phase of the migration. This is, uh, this is one step that's skipped or ever in, in the planning phase, it can cause disaster. Um, because this is how you can improve if you, do, you know, and how can you how can you improve if you don't take the time to review your your success and, and failure? If the driver of the, of the migration is, is to take advantage of a trial or a promotional offering, ensure that this is um, that, that that this point is a point in the migration plan, because the licenses that you have now may not be suitable or fit for purpose for the future requirements. If you have any doubts about what's included in a license, just get, just get in touch with us. And finally, the um, subscription provider, right? So you can subscribe direct to the Microsoft Marketplace or purchase direct from a large res reseller. But things that you don't get with, with this, right, is you don't get the self-service password portal for licenses. You often don't get the premier support. So that's 24 by 7 by 365 support and typically no UK engineers. By purchasing via a partner, so someone like Perfect Image, so what you get with these ones is you do get access to the self-service licenses. You obviously do get your premium support and we are UK-based engineers. You'll never pay more than RRP or marketplace prices. But one of those big differentiators there is that advanced support that is included. Now, only a small percentage of um, of cases that, that are logged with us actually need to get escalated to, to, to Microsoft. 
right? So what does this actually mean for you? Well, you benefit from our experiences, uh, um, you know, a quicker resolution and first time fixes. So licensing can be confusing. So up on the screen are six of the most popular 365 plans. Now there's over 20 different Microsoft and Office 365 plans, and there's about 70 to 80 other um, add-on licenses. Um, there's, there's various plan options that you can choose from that to provide your users with the services and the functionality they require without over, overpaying for a service they don't need. This is where Perfect Image can work with you to choose the right plans for your business. So Office 365 versus Microsoft 365, what's the difference? Generally speaking, Microsoft 365 plans provide the productivity applications, whereas Microsoft 365 can be seen as a complete package. For the price point for with these ones on screen, um, Microsoft 365 Business Premium is, a, you know, is the best value plan for SMB customers of up to, the, up to 300 user, users. If you look at the Microsoft 365 business brand and compare that with the common bundle we see, which is the E3 and EMS E3 plan, there's very little it doesn't cover and it saves you around nine pounds per user per month. Now, I'd like to point out that this chart on screen is only a section of a full comparison, but it points out the most common requirements. I'll just quickly check for some more questions. Uh, one. So, why is Microsoft 365 Business advised for up to 300 users? Well, 300 users is the maximum number of licenses you can have for a, for that license type, right? So, that's the same for Business Standard as well. So, you can have up to 300 licenses, but then if you need more than 300, that's when you have to then you know start consuming the say the E3 plan but you don't need to jump everyone up to E3. So you can have 300 of the business premium and two of the E3 to make up your 302 user requirement. Three, six, five over volume licenses or other perpetual purchases. One example here is the ability to co-author documents. For the ease of this demo, I've used a Windows virtual desktop in a, um, in a browser rather than jumping between full remote desktop sessions. On the left in the green, um, with, with the green background, is, is a user using a Chrome, back, um, Chrome browser. And on the right is another session running a Safari browser. So any of these, so any of the web-based virtual desktop sessions, um, screen sizes can be resized to, to suit your size or, or, or your device. And the actual desktop itself will automatically resize in the background. So what we're going to do here is we're going to uh, open up a document. It's currently stored in OneDrive, and we're going to share this document with the user to our left, which is with the green background there. So we can add a bit of uh, add a comment in there. So therefore, these so therefore the user will know what this file's to do with. So we're just going to now all this is in real time. We're not doing any any hocus pocus, any, any any magic here. So when the document's received, the user will, will, will get an email, and we can see see the comment that we added to the file, and they'll open the file. Now this user is opening the file in a web browser in the in the in the, in the online session here, and over on the right hand side, what we've just seen is the an email has been been sent to the to the person who shared the file, saying that someone's opened that link that they've been sent. So, in the web browser session, what we'll do is we'll scroll down into the um, into the executive su summary section, and then what we'll do on the right hand side in this user session, we'll actually open up the full desktop. Functionality online and the desktop is pretty good. You're, you're probably about 90% there for functionality. 
maybe maybe even a bit higher you know for the um and we're talking about there for the for the web or the online version so scroll to our executive summary and what we'll do is we'll make a change in here but we'll just show you that any changes we're making over here on the right hand side are immediately reflected to the left hand side now these users are in separate locations they could be in different countries opposite sides of the world the the experience and what is the same so if we close the document on our left what we'll do that then do is we'll now actually reopen this document and you'll see we're going to pick up where we left off Okay, so we'll just scroll down here again. And what we'll do this time is we'll make changes for this user in the online version. And you're going to see that it's reflecting across to the you know, desktop version. So this is the same. If you were using this on an on Android tablet, if you're using it on, a, on an iPad or an iPhone, you're going to get the same results. So we're going to go to the picture there so you can see that straight away it's reflected across. Now there's different ways of doing this. You can you can you can you can put your mode in editing, viewing, reviewing. You can opt to open this document in Word over the online version. We'll quickly do the same here, but we'll do the same this time with a Excel document just to show you the kind of slight difference in, in behavior. We'll send it to the same user. Email to come through. Should I take a moment? So that's the previous email that we got last time for the Word document. The new one has just arrived now. So now we've got the new link for the Excel document. And we'll click on the link. And again, we'll open this up in the online version of Excel. So again, we'll open up the document on the right hand side. Word, but first we'll just sign in to this user because I hadn't signed into the online Excel previously, just to make sure we're going to get our full functionality. So what we saw there was the the we could see the users that were actually logged into this session. Um, yeah, so we're only seeing one icon for one user, but if we had five, ten users you'd see more icons for, for more users if we make a change over here to to this cell change here to this cell and what we're going to see is we haven't seen the information reflect immediately over to the right. That's because Excel, the way that the sharing works and Excel works is it, it locks the cell that the user is editing. And then once the user comes out of that cell, it then releases it and it will be updated to anyone else that's authoring the document. Deleted four sections here. We can see it's reflecting across to the user on the right. And if we scroll down to a random location in the document, and we'll start editing here. Now, if the user on the right wants to know where the other user is actually making the, the, the document, all we've got to do is click on the user on, the, on, our, on our icon. We can chat with them, or we can go to their location. So we go to the location, we can see straight away, that's where that user is. And again, it hasn't updated because we, uh, because we have the cell locked on the left. Now we've jumped out and we'll see it update across the side. So just one last thing here is we can see again, like we did last time, that this is the confirmation that the document has been accessed. And even within here, what we can do is we can click on the link and we can revoke 
any permissions that we've shared to any user. So if we've accidentally shared it to the wrong user, we've been notified, then we can revoke their permission and they'll no longer have access to that file. Okay, so I'll just check for any questions before I move on. Okay, so um, question is, how many users can work on the, on, on the document at the same time? Well, there's a soft limit of 10 users for co-authoring you know, the same document at the same time, but this can be changed up to a hard limit of 99 users. Um, we, within Perfect Image, we're quite often co-authoring documents. I never normally see more than five people in the document. And it's great to have that real life and kind of real, real world of you know, um, working collaboratively on a document remotely and seeing where the users are. Okay, so have you completed a rapid or rushed migration in order to provide your staff with a remote working solution? You've been, have you been left with two identities? Did you forget to enable single sign-on or configure password portal? There is a way back and you still should configure AD Connect to synchronize your identities. It will take some planning and is more complicated, but it's not too late and make sure you correct this now. Did you synchronize your entire directory without first doing a cleanup? You now may have duplicate, duplicate accounts, service accounts, and accounts for users have left your, your organization synced with, with Azure AD. If you've completed a rapid migration, you should be planning the, the remediation actions now. So you're not limiting users' experience or options in the future for expansion. Ongoing planning and training. Um, a major a major reason is that employees could be tempted to switch back to the ways of the old for working and undoing the investments you've placed in your rollout and your project plan is a lack of training. You can't assume that users will simply log in and become pros. Even though the, even though the most cleared up, um, cleared up users may not be aware of, of, of the huge variety and built-in tools within Microsoft, um, Microsoft Office. Although Microsoft automatically alerts users to, to new features and provides guides and prompts, the team managing your Office 365 onboarding checklist should keep an eye out for these new updates and monitor user ad adoption. I'll discuss a way that you can report upon users activity later. So realizing the full um, potential, it's very common to find SharePoint is well and truly underutilized and in many cases not utilized at all. Microsoft has taken all the pre-planning and maintenance requirements away from you, leaving you to concentrate on the collaboration and productivity for your teams. If you're not fully utilizing SharePoint or planning a migration from file servers to SharePoint, then you're not gonna get the most out of your 365 plan. Once you're free of file servers, you should be reviewing your need for Active Directory requirements. Why not manage your users and devices in Azure Active Directory and Intune? If you're left with some legacy applications that require these services, that's when you can use Windows Virtual Desktop to provide secure access for users who still require the legacy applications, either via full Windows 10 desktop or publish the application via a web browser to limit users' access to the desktops and make them accessible. If you're not using Teams, now's the time. On top of the video and audio conferencing, Teams bring together all the Microsoft 365 productivity tools in one place. And finally, reassess your security. When, it, when, when we're assisting new customers you know, in, in existing 365 um, environments, what I generally find is when the business has migrated to Office 365, the identity and data security is often overlooked. Businesses may be paying for a, the security and compliance functionality but they've never ventured into these portals. When, um, when we ask the question, have you asked your partner, you know, have you discussed securing your applications and your user's identity? Often, sadly, the answer is no. The next couple of slides will discuss security for Office 365 for documents and the user's identity at a high level. If you'd like any more info on these topics, feel free uh, to, um, to, to ask more questions, but also if you want to review the my previous webinar, which is part one, make the most out of your Microsoft 365 investment. I went into a bit more detail in that one. So years ago, 
having firewall, PC antivirus, email filtering, and a backup solution was sufficient to protect your business. Typically, your office for here you know, or building's four walls was the first perimeter, and attacker had to be in the building to gain access to your network. With users' identity and data moving to the cloud, increased mobile access, and cyber criminals getting more and more sophisticated, times have changed. But has your business changed with these times? With users' identity and data now in the cloud, rather than being inside your location on a network you control, the attack surface has increased and there's more points to consider. Users are more user, users are using more and more mobile devices, which they can lose. When they're working from home, coffee shops, airports, airplanes. Well, that was kind of five months ago. We'll see what happens in the next five months. Cyber criminals are going after more and more, more sophisticated ways. You've got phishing attacks. You know, they're getting harder and harder to recognize. You've got ransomware. You've got social engineering you know, attacks that take advantage of people being too busy. So we've seen a, about a 20% rise in cyber attacks re reported since the pandemic began. Cyber criminals have upped their game and you need to stay on top. You know, using the right Microsoft 365 features along with a managed service provider to manage and maintain and stay up to date lets you focus on your business and, and, and user requirements. On average, it takes more than 99 days for a business to discover they've been breached. 30% of users open emails from attackers with 10% clicking on the links or attachments. 63% of passwords a week stolen or default. 50% of users accidentally share the information. And on stats is 81% of all hacking related breaches use compromised credentials. 75% of individuals use only three to four passwords across all of their accounts. 88% of organizations feel they're losing control of their data. So just quickly point out this one here. So this is main Microsoft service um, level agreement that recommends backup. So section B, the last sentence, we recommend that you regularly back up your contents and data that you store on services or store using third-party apps. So if you're not backing up your 365 data or you're not sure, if nothing else today, please check this or to ensure you have a strategy to recover. You know, a, make sure you're happy with the native options available or B, talk to us and we'll tell you what other options are available. If you want more information on backup for Office 365, we ran an hour long webinar um, that, that's called um, SaaS protection, protecting uh, uh, workers using Office 365 and G Suite. And you can view that one on demand. So how do you protect your user's identity? The number one thing you can do is implement MFA for all users is multi-factor authentication. You should assume that the user's credentials have been compromised. So here's, here's a you know, classic example. Yeah, the whole um, Ashley Madison breach. So people were using their work accounts to hide their activities from their partners. But when the data breach occurred, many of the passwords were common with their 365 accounts because people only used three to four passwords. So what this allowed were for either the accounts to be direct breached or for targeted phishing campaigns for, you know, sometimes enough to get access to the, to the 365 accounts. If MFA was enforced, then over 99% of the attackers would not have been able to gain access. Devices can be managed in two ways. You have a corporate and personal. If you use bring your own devices to prevent data leakage, um, you know, by personal devices, you can restrict copy and saved non-managed applications. So how does this work and what do we mean by non-managed applications? So you create a policy that enforces users to enroll the device into Intune you know, to access company app applications or resources. This could be email, SharePoint, OneDrive, or other specified applications. If the device is personal, then the business applications are effectively in a bubble. If the device is locked, stolen, or you have a bad lever, can enforce a remote wipe of the application without affecting the personal data on that device. If it's a company supply device um, and yeah, a company managed device, then you have more control. Depending upon the on the on the device, you can enforce a complete remote wipe, um, you know, based on incorrect passwords, or you can actually set it back to the out of the box experience, ready for the next user. 
Um, also, the difference between company versus personal is typically how the device is enrolled. If it's user initiated, it tends to be personal. If it's automated, such as autopilot, then it will be corporate. So the settings can be changed by an issuing administrator at any other date. So we'll have a quick look here at um, Azure Information Protection, so also referred to as AIP. So the user applies protection to the document. Then AIP encrypts the document and stores the key. The user then sends a link to to the user. It could either be a link to a document or, it, or you could be encrypting the entire email. When the user opens the document, uh, AIP checks to see if that user is authenticated. And AIP then sends the decryption and the, and the user can view, the, can view the document. With Azure Information Protection and the, and the Rights Management, those permissions can be revoked again at a later date. A, you have strong information, B, that user now leaves the company. So even if that that document is saved on a thumb drive that's offline, it will check in with Azure Information Protection before the user can open that document. And so if you revoke their rights, that's how you've now restricted access to that document. If you've introduced a new system or users have a new tool they're utilizing, there's nothing worse than you removing that system your workforce has embraced. But on the flip side, if you're now having to pay for this new system, You've implemented, then you want to ensure that you're getting the most out of it and of the usage up to allow you to retire legacy systems. You need the ability to report upon usage and consumption of services whilst you're implementing or trialing a new solution. You need to know are your users using the service? If not, why not? Or are they using a service you didn't even know you had or, or officially released to those users? The graphic on the screen. Um, now is from, from the Office 365 admin portal and under the reporting tab. This gives an overview of the usage of Office 365 services uh, for your users are, are using within your tenancy. When you click on one of these tabs, it allows you to dig a bit deeper. 365 plan you have and how advanced you are into your de deployment. Uh, it could even be a lack of knowledge of what products or features you have available. Um, you may be yet to explore um, um, Azure Information Protection and Sensitive Labels. These, uh, these graphs are from the Security and Compliance Portal. Again, if you click into the graph in more detail, so if we click into the DLP, which is Data Loss Prevention, it will show the next tier of information. Now what we're, now what we're looking at here is the um, Data Loss Prevention Incident Report, and you can toggle through the different and surface up more information. Now, if we dig deeper into the data loss prevention policy match, we can investigate and identify the user that has caused this match in this report example. You can also specify the action, you know, notify the user, um, or you can enforce a password reset if you suspect malicious activity. So if we go back to the Office 365 users, um, yeah, if we go back into the Office 365 reports, and we'll have a look, and we'll have a look now at the team statistics. So pre-COVID times, teams may not have been a product that you deployed to your business for one reason or another, but it would have been available to your users unless you put in policies to restrict them having access. So now you're able to get more insight to how users are using Teams, including stats on meeting call, meetings, calls, chats, or channels messages. So this is the same whether it be for SharePoint or for OneDrive. When you do look at the OneDrive and the SharePoint, you start to get the statistics on, where, on what documents have been shared to external sources as well. There's a, a, um, a, a product based upon a free trial or a promotional offer. Due to the nature of cloud and the pay-as-you-go model, you can change that plan at any stage. This may be during the trial as your requirements have changed, or maybe once, once the promotion has, has ended. If you've activated the Office 365 E1 trial and it's coming to an end, you should already be reviewing if this is the right plan for your business. You may have been using that trial to enable the migration and limit your implementation costs. It's a common, common approach we see, but also recommend to our customers yeah, when it's a suitable option. Perfect Image works with you to get 
all the available funding from vendors, Microsoft, Amazon, or even third parties um, you know, that, that resell these services. We want to provide the most cost-effective solution available and the right plans for the right users. Time to modernize and use all the tools and products that you have available to you now. If you don't, your competitors will, and they'll have the advantage of cost reductions, added functionality, and even the ability to work from anywhere. Right now, remote working has never been more in the spotlight. Your, your employees' expectations to be able to continue to work remotely in a post-COVID world to continue to grow. They expect to have the tools and the platforms to allow this. If you're not fully utilizing SharePoint or planning a migration from SharePoint, then you're not getting the most out of this 365 plan. The, the examples on screen are just a couple of companies that have modernized and experienced massive growth, and in some cases, their competitors have vanished altogether. Just like Microsoft, AWS, and other vendors, Perfect Image are, are offering incentives and free consultations uh, to support our customers and develop their work, remote working force. I'll go into a little detail around each of these, but if you want more information, please get in touch. Our details will be on the following slide. So, Perfect Image Cloud Optimization Consultancy. So this one's about around customers who are already in the cloud. So whether that be Office 365, whether that be Azure, whether that be AWS. Yeah, it's it's all too common for for um you know, to find that customers or you know, opportunities um you know where where people have resources provisioned but they have no idea what function it performs. The problem is not unique to cloud, you know, but on premise. But but with on premise, you've already bought the hardware, so you generally don't see these problems until your hardware reaches capacity or timelines. We want to be able to optimize your cloud spend. The Perfect Image Managed Service Consultation, this one's around um, kind of reviewing what your requirements for a managed services service is. You know, is it for desktop support? Is it for service support? Is it monitoring? Is it telephony? And it's and, and then importantly, is, is it kind of working with you to understand, do you have an internal team that you want us to augment it into? Do you have the right skill sets? Do you want to outsource the work for a period of time? Are you after level one, two or third line support? Um, so it's 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 really what your requirements are. Apologies. On there is the cloud ready, with the cloud readiness assessment. So this one here is is is, is all around discussing what your organizational cloud strategy is, you know, and your level of cloud maturity. We need to understand where you are on, on your journey. All right now, Perfect Image provides the end-to-end -end solutions, you know. We're cloud agnostic, so we will advise what is the right provider for you and your application use. So I hope today's webinar gave some insights into what trials are available and to get you started, but also provide enough information to enable you to continue. All right, I'll do one final check for questions. So I've got a question here about sensitivity labels. So what license do I need for sensitivity labels and day loss prevention? So there's a few options available to you. And there's and there, so you've got the bundled products and you've got standalone SKUs. So it depends what license you have now, whether you've purchased that on a one year or three, you know, one year or, or monthly. But um, ultimately you, you can start with the Microsoft 365 Business Premium. So this, this would be, Look, if you look at that at your entry level license, because it gives you your productivity, but it gives you the core features from the security and compliance portal as well. Now, um, Microsoft Office 365 E3, uh, Office 365 E3 also provides these ones, or you do have your standalone SKUs as well. Um, licensing is a funny one. Licensing is something that I would love to have a conversation to you about and understand actually what your requirements are, and then, then we can specify which license meets your needs. If you're starting to need some of the automation because you don't want your users to have to, have to label documents, then you're kind of edging up into the E5 licensing sides of things. 
Well, thank you for attending today. Um, you'll be sent a link following the session um, it, and where, where you can request a free consultation. Uh, otherwise, you can email us with the, with the email on screen or find us on LinkedIn. So this is part two of a seven part series. The next webinar is part three, uh, adapting to users' expectations for remote working. Okay, thank you for your time.